Right, it's eight o'clock. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, while people are still trickling in, let's get started. Uh, I hope everyone had a great uh, uh, time yesterday afternoon at the Devil's Lake outing. So today we, is the final day of our program. Also, we have a full packed program. So to start out with, we have a, a very exciting tutorial talk to be given by Professor Ogar Vitek from Northeast, Northeastern University. So just a little bit background about uh, Professor Vitek. So she holds a BS degree from the University of Geneva, Switzerland, and then a master's degree in mathematics st uh, statistics, and then PhD in statistics from Purdue University. And she then did a postdoc uh, uh, position at Ebersolt Lab at um, Institute of Systems Biology in Seattle. So then she started her own independent uh, career uh, at, at Purdue University as an assistant professor first, and then ranked to associate professor starting December uh, uh, starting 2006. And, and then she moved her program to Northeastern University in uh, the summer of 2014. And her uh, research program is actually uh, centers around developing innovative statistical and computational methods for systems-wide molecular investigations of bio uh, biological um, organisms, and also including many of the high throughput large scale investigation of quantitative genomics, proteomics, metabolomics, and many omics, and centered based on mass spec based uh, technologies. And um, uh, Ogar has received a numerous award for her research, including NSF Career Award, um, and also she's currently serving on the board of directors of the U.S. Uh, HUPO. So with that, I will turn the uh, podium to Professor Vitek. Please join me in welcoming uh, Ogar to our campus. kind invitation. Um, so indeed, I'm a statistician by training, and my lab is interested in all things quantitative investigations, and in particular, quantitative mass spectrometry. And so before I tell you a little bit about what we do and, um, and all that, so first let's maybe talk about why we need statistics. Why do we even need to have this uh, conversation? And the fact is that in the investigations that we're interested in, in particular quantitative mass spectrometry-based investigations, variation and uncertainty are a fact of life. They are unavoidable for many reasons, so there's a lot of technical variation which happens due to the fact that we handle samples differently, store, process, and so on. There is instrumental variation, ion suppression, elution, differences in elution time. Um, there is signal processing, as we will see, different tools make different decisions in how they locate, quantify, identify peaks, and so on. And all of that adds uncertainty and variability in our conclusions. But even if all of that was perfect, even if we could perfect our workflows infinitely, we're still not done. And the reason is that we are interested in studies of living systems and in studies of living organisms. And even if we measure everything very accurately, we still have to deal with biological variation because there is a natural variability of protein abundance from one person to another, from one day to another of the same person. And so the questions we would like to answer is, is the change in protein abundance, which is induced by treatment or by disease or by some other condition, is it more systematic than as expected by random variability? And this is why we need statistics regardless of how accurate and how precise our workflows are. And so, um, you can think of statistics as a body of methods for making wise decisions in the face of uncertainty. And so statisticians really, is it okay, the microphone, there's a feedback, it's okay? Yeah. And so statisticians can contribute to this whole process at least in three ways. So the first is experimental design. How can we design the experiments in a way that our conclusions are as unbiased as possible, as accurate as possible, but also effective? And to me, this is the most important contribution of statisticians. But then the second is data analysis. Once we have the data, we need to make sure that the interpretation of the data are objective, follows some objective criteria, and can be uh, reproducible. 
And of course, the third thing is statistical tools. Uh, we may think, okay, we need software because the data large. This is true, but there's a lot more to it. Again, in terms of reproducibility and, and documentation and understanding how things were done, it is really important to develop our analysis in the software. And so my group contributes to all of the three aspects here, and I will illustrate a little bit what we do um, as well. But before I do that, let me illustrate to you why this is so challenging and why statistical methods and software are extremely critical for everything we do as far as quantitative methods. So, but, so first, um, let's just focus on uh, label-free quantification and uh, data-dependent acquisition. Uh, in case you haven't seen this before, let me just give you a very brief overview of what it actually takes to process and uh, analyze the data. So we would have two branches of the workflow. So on one hand, we will have MSMS spectra, which serve for identification. On the other, have we had, on the other hand, we have LCMS profiles, which have retention time on one axis and M over Z on another axis. And so we would like to, on one hand, identify the spectra, for example, by database search to have peptide sequences which originated MSMS spectra and then map them to proteins. And I believe you will be doing this with Alexei uh, just after this hour. On the other hand, we also need to have uh, locate individual peaks in the LCMS profile. So the intensity or the, of the peak is related to the abundance of the analyte. And what we want to do is to map the identities to the peaks, align the peaks between the runs, and this allows us now to say, okay, this is the protein with known identity. If we have several runs, let's say from healthy and several runs from disease, is the change in this analyte more systematic than as expected by random chance? <coughs> so this is, well, I hope you have seen that, but that's really what we do. And so this is from this point, this is where kind of sti quantitative statistical analysis start. So to show you how challenging it is and why it is so important to have this conversation about statistical methods. I just want to give an example of a study that my group was involved with. This is a study by Association of Biomedical Resource <laughs> Facilities. So these are core facilities that are interested in developing best practice in use of some pretty standard workflows. And in this study, they were interested in how well can we detect changes in protein abundance between conditions. And what they do, they would provide either raw data or um, files from uh, mass, mass analysis to various members of their community and everybody will do the analysis according to their practice and they will compare the results. And then they will use this to decide what is a good practice and they will kind of establish, um, kind of provide some ideas of good practice uh, for this task. And so here, if, if we want to evaluate what was a good answer, what was a bad answer, we want to have some setting where we have some concept of ground truth. So for that, in this study, we had a controlled mixture of known composition, which had yeast background, uh, yeast lysed uh, as a background. And then we had this protein spiked in the mixture in different and varying concentrations. And these concentrations were known. And so the question would be, can we detect these changes in abundance among the spike proteins without claiming changes in the background proteins? And so this was analyzed by the organizers on a thermal instrument in a DDA profile mode. And the data were given to the participants. So essentially the question was, okay, here's the data, same experiment, just analyze the data and tell us how, wh what you find. And we gave choice to the participants to start from raw data completely, or we only did this branch where we did the identification of MSMS spectra and then they could do their own workflow for quantification. Or we did the whole thing and we just said, okay, just do statistics. And people could start wherever they felt comfortable. So different starting points. And this is the result of the submission. So here, the x-axis is the ID of the participants and this is all double blind that we don't know who they are. The y-axis is the number of reported proteins and here are the participants who decided to do quantification by integrating the intensity of MS1 peaks. This was another approach by counting MSMS spectra, so the counts of this spectra <coughs> are informative of protein abundance, and then some other methods. In yellow are people who started with raw data, brown are different intermediate files which we gave to them. And here the y-axis is the number of reported proteins by the participants. <coughs> 
you see already that in terms of the number of proteins, there is quite a bit of variability in how much was reported. Well, these people misunderstood the instructions, which also happens. <laughs> <laughs> well, so that's already something, right? So even in terms of identification, we see that we do not get a consistent and reproducible results. But more important is the quantification. And so here we have the x-axis, again, is the identifier of the participants. Below this horizontal line are the number of true changes. So we have four choose two possible comparisons, right, between four concentrations. Below the horizontal line are the number of true positives which were reported by each participant. Above the horizontal line are the, is the number of false positives. Right? See the difference? Regardless of the method and regardless of the starting point, you had labs that did really well and you had labs that did not do well. And so that was really made a really strong impression on us to see how much discrepancy there is between different members of core facilities. Now, probably some of them were playing with different methods. They could submit multiple analyses. Maybe some, they knew these were not a good methods. But still, right, there were reasonable methods enough to be submitted for the evaluation. Well, what we could also do is to look at the fold changes. So these are absolute values of log fold changes among background proteins only reported by each study. So the x-axis here is the same order as the x-axis uh, in this plot. So what we see is that there is quite a bit of variability among the background proteins. So some of these fall changes are pretty large. However, this group was not misled by those large fall changes. And they could distinguish some random artifacts from the systematic changes from the spiked proteins. This group clearly was misled by some of these fall changes and they mistook them for true differences. And so this is where statistical mindset is really important. So what's systematic and what's an artifact, right? So this is where kind of the core of our work is. Well, so the participants also did uh, fill a questionnaire trying to describe exactly what they did. And there was really many questions in terms of what was your input, how you identified the spectra, how you found the peaks, and so on, right? So there's different. And what we try to do is to use colors to characterize some of these methods um, by groups. It was really difficult. Some people said, you know, in-house software, well, what do you know, right? Or like R scripts, right? So it's really hard to, to say much. Um, so the point here is that there are many colors. So there are really many ways to go about this problem. There's a great diversity of methods that people currently use to detect the differences in protein abundance between conditions. Well, we tried to kind of find some, you know, patterns here. Didn't really find anything meaningful. We ended up ranking or comparing each participant by the positive predictive value. So it's number of true changes, proportion of true changes among the reported changes. And so here is a well-performing group with more than 70% of true positives in their list. Here is between 20 and 70 percent, and this is really bad, less than 20 percent. So that's really what we wanted to do. And so now the next question is when we looked at that, of course, people were asking, OK, can we look at the individual tools? Like, did Max Quan do better than Skyline? You know, or like something else, right? So this was a really, you know, burning question for many. Well, let's take a look. So here there's several submissions which use Max Quant and Perseus. Some did well. Some didn't do so well. These are two submissions which used Skyline and some linear modeling in R. Some did better than others. These were groups comparing peak intensity versus spectral counts. So this group found that peak intensity works as well as spectral counts. This found that one works much better than the other. So the conclusions very much vary, you know, even if they use the same tools. So the only pattern which was really meaningful that we found was this. So here, this column is the identifier of the lab that did the analysis, and they could submit multiple analysis. And here, I circle multiple submissions from the same lab. And so what you see that, that with one exception, the circles never cross this line. So the labs who are experts, they can use multiple tools, and they will do well. And the labs who need training, they can use multiple tools. And and to me, this was the most important conclusion from the study, that do not trust the tools. 
Do not say, okay, I use tool so and so, and therefore I have good result. Or I have small p-value or something, and therefore I would have good result. There is a lot more nuances and a lot more details here, which need to be really understood very profoundly, so that you can really um, kind of be closer to reproducible and accurate <coughs> conclusions. So even if we don't have much time for anything else, so my biggest conclusion, kind of message to you right now is, don't just blindly use tools. You know, I, sometimes people tell me, we really have these great instruments and we have these great biological samples, and then we do data analysis, right? So data analysis is just as important as everything else that comes up front. So this is a really important message to me. Okay, so now let me uh, talk a little bit about how my group views these problems and how we hope to contribute um, to this field. And the first part is relatively kind of less technical, and the second part I'll just give you a little bit on the more technical side of what it actually means. So uh, this is the motivation of our work. Long time ago, when I was a postdoc, and it was a collaboration with the Abersold Lab, and at that time, one of the colleagues was uh, interested in comparing two breast cancer cell lines, um, low and high invasive. But she had a fairly complicated question. So not only this for two breast cancer cell lines, but also exposure to oxygen. So this was normal expo exposure, and this was low oxygen. And the same thing here. And in this, in each cell line, there were multiple cell cultures. For each cell culture, there were multiple sample preps. And for each sample prep, there were multiple mass spectrometry runs. So this was a pretty complicated experiment. And her questions were also complicated. So she wanted to know, is the change in oxygen exposure for this cell line results in the same regulation of proteins as the change in protein exposure in this cell line. So it's not just like A versus B. So these are fairly complicated comparisons. And at that time, uh, it was not very clear to her how to do that. And this really was a motivation for our work. How can we work, work with very complicated experiments like that? So this is one protein from this study. Here, the x-axis is the, all the combination of the conditions. Each dot is a peak in the LCMS space. Each color is a peptide. And the line links the averages of peptide intensities on the log scale between the conditions. And so some things are obvious. Clearly, this protein is down-regulated in high-invasive cell line. But if you now start kind of looking for the effect of oxygen, it's not trivial at all, because peptides don't agree. These are some missing values and outliers and so on. How can we integrate all this information that pertains to one protein, account for missing values, account for outliers, for some discrepancies in peptides, and make some conclusions? So that was really the motivation uh, for what we do. So since then, the way our kind of work grew was expanding on that. And we developed an approach and a software called MSStats, which really uh, kind of looks for questions such as what's changing between conditions. So which proteins change in abundance, including complex designs, factorial experiments, pair design, time course, and so on. At this point, we work with label-free or label-based experiments, so DDA, targeted SRM, data independent acquisition, uh, parallel reaction monitoring. Recently, we also started working with chemical labeling with TMT. We have a separate module uh, for that. And the functionalities would involve data visualization, statistical modeling, and inference sample size. If there's one question, most frequent question that people ask me is how many replicates I need. Well, this is actually a non-trivial question because you need to know how much variability you have in the system. It means that you need to have some pilot data which will tell you how much variation you have. And so what we do now is that every time we analyze a data set, we immediately treat it as a pilot study for something else. And we will understand how much variation is, and we will provide some uh, estimates of sample size calculation. We also do additional work in terms of system suitability, assay characterization, and so on. And importantly, we're trying to be as inclusive as possible and work with <coughs> every possible tool that identifies and quantifies peaks, Skyline, MaxQuant, OpenMS, and also commercial tools, Spectrum of Proteome Discover, and so on. So um, just last thing about also how we think we do a lot of things in R. Everything is implemented in R and open source. And I think it's important because from the user perspective, it's very lightweight. It requires minimal software uh, and hardware. It's interactive. From our perspective, there is a lot of statistical research, which is carried into R, and we can leverage that 
And also, most importantly, when we use scripting languages, our code is immediately our lab notebook, so it documents exactly what we do. And so that really contributes critically to reproducibility. OK, so this is how we see the ex quantitative experiment from our perspective. So as I mentioned, oftentimes people describe their methods, right? And then there is a little box data analysis. So here is the opposite, right? This is statistics. This is statistics, and I have a little data experiment, you know, <laughs> and all of that, right? <laughs> Not to uh, diminish that, but the point is that from our perspective, we need to do just as much on the statistics side before starting the experiment as after the data are collected. And this is something which is really underappreciated often. So let me focus on this part uh, for the moment. So experimental design, first of all, we need to understand what the goals of the study are. Is it an exploratory study? Are we looking at changes between protein abundance, between conditions? Or are we doing things such as biomarker discovery, which actually require very different type of analysis? And this is important because different goals would require different designs and different analysis strategies. So what I will talk about here in the interest of time is which proteins change in abundance on average between conditions. And then, of course, there are biological aspects, selection of biological replicates. What do they represent? Which populations they represent? How many we need? Uh, technical replicates, but potentially. And also technological aspects. Would such and such sample prep, for example, labeling, help achieve my goal? And statistical mindset help can help that quite a bit. So this was this example that I just mentioned. Here is another example of a complex design, which also requires really a lot of kind of statistical c consideration. This was a collaboration we had um, with uh, clinicians who work on childhood cancer. And they had 10 healthy controls where they had plasma samples at one time point. But then they had uh, osteosarcoma patients who had blood samples, a diagnosis, uh, at chemotherapy pre-surgery, post-surgery, and then also of toxicology and the follow-up um, at subsequent months. And so here is a combination of comparing two groups in a time course. And people would want to ask complicated questions, for example, what's which proteins are differentially abundant at diagnosis, which proteins are affected by the treatment and time, which proteins at the end of the treatment become similar in abundance to the controls, and which proteins are permanently affected, and so on. So these are complex designs which require complex models. And what we try to do is to use these models um, kind of in the background in MS stats, find what is the right model for this problem and fit it. Okay, so once the experiment is done, we would take as input the results of tools such as MaxQuant, OpenMS, uh, Proteome Discover, Skyline, and so on. And the steps that we would need to perform are visualizing the data, checking for quality control, considering missing and outlying peaks, um, and from that point we will be doing the statistical analysis. So this would be the input of the data for us. So it's essentially a tabular format. So here each row is a peak in the LCMS space. Each has a protein name and peptide name, precursor, charge, fragment, and so on. Importantly, it has condition and biological replicates. So this is the information and the run. So this is the information which we put together to look for changes in abundance. And the next most important step, and in my opinion, it's one of the most important steps in the whole data analysis pipeline, is the normalization. So here is one plot which MS stats would generate. Here, the x-axis is mass spectrometry run. The vertical lines break the runs by condition. In this case, it's a time course experiment with 10 time points, and we have three replicates per time point. And the y-axis is log intensity of everything which was quantified in that run across all peaks, all peptides, all proteins. And so the boxes are, the, so the actual box covers 50% of all the data, right? And the line in the middle, it's the median log intensity for that run. And so what we see here is that the signal goes up as time points progress. And the question is, is it biology or is it technology? And the fact is, it can be both. And if it's technology, we will be very likely 
we are very likely to mistake some of these drifts for the true biological effects. On the other hand, if this is true biology, we want to know about that. So how can we work with that? There are several options that we implement, and uh, in, in our view, they, these are reasonable options for mass spectrometry, although there is no perfect solutions. The first is using standard-based normalization. The goal is to eliminate technological artifacts between the runs, so if we have a standard protein which is spiked in every sample, in every run, in as constant concentration as possible, so what we can do is equalize the log intensities of this standard between the runs, because any variation we see in this protein is technology, right? There is no biology in it, it's a standard protein. And so then it will be stay constant between the runs. There are good things about that, right? Because we know that it's supposed to be constant, but there are also a number of bad things because it only counts for artifacts which happen after you spike the standard. If something happened at the digestion step or at the sample storage step, the spiked proteins will not be able to help us. Also, spiked proteins, well, you know, or spiked standards, they're not perfect. Maybe they can have overlaps in, peak in, in peaks with some other peaks, right? Maybe they're not stable. And if we try to normalize with respect to something which is not stable, we can add more trouble than uh, help. And our standard procedure here is to actually use multiple standards and use some standards for normalization and then look to see, to see what happened to the other standards. If it improved the other standards, it means that normalization worked. If the other standards became more variable between the runs, then it means that the normalization didn't work. So this is one option. The other option um, is median normalization. Now this is something which is used in genomics. So you see that here, after constant normalization, those centers in the boxes, they're not exactly equal, right? In many experiments, especially in experiments with large molecular coverage, like DDA or DIA experiments, you can expect that the majority of the proteins are not changing in abundance between conditions. So it's actually meaningful to assume that the median intensities should be the same between the runs. So median normalization will equalize the middles of these boxes between the runs. It will not use standards. So it's a good thing because now it accounts for everything that happened to the sample from the collection to data acquisition. But the problem is that it assumes that the majority of the things did not change. So here's an experiment which was a dilution experiment where we know that there are changes in abundance of all the proteins in the sample. If we now equalize the medians, it's not a good idea, right? Because we lose the signal. So it's also not something that we can always and automatically do. And then there is a even more aggressive normalization which equalizes not just the middles of the boxes but every single aspect of the box. It's a quantum normalization. It comes from genomics and from gene expression microarrays, but it makes even stronger assumptions that everything is constant and only a very small percentage of proteins are regulated. So essentially, what happens is that the choice of normalization depends very much on which standards you have, what the standards represent, and what is a reasonable assumption for each data set. So normalizations make assumptions. And oftentimes, people don't realize that, and I would probably argue that a large proportion of these false positives in this ABRF study was probably due to some of the issues with normalization that they had. Um, so in this particular example that we have, uh, it actually turns out it is a targeted experiment which had only a small number of proteins targeted. So because of that, these changes are actually true biological changes. The proteins were targeted because we expected things to be changing. But it had this large number of standards where for each endogenous protein, we had a reference peptide spiked in, a, in constant concentration. And so now what we would do here, we'll actually equalize the boxes of the reference standards because there's no biology there. We can assume equal um, patterns. Apply these transformations to the endogenous, and we see that now we have the biological signal preserved. So that's what we do uh, with these tools. And the output would be like this. So here is, so, so uh, for the statistical analysis, and there's a lot that's going on, and I will clarify it next, what we'll actually report in terms of comparisons between conditions after normalization and after statistical analysis is what people often call volcano plot. So here the x-axis is the log fold change between conditions, and the y-axis is the p-value, so statistical significance. We take negative logs so that large values mean more significant. 
And there is a very important step called adjustment for multiple testing to control false discovery rate, which we also need to incorporate. And so now the x-axis is our what we call practical significance, y-axis is statistical significance. And we're interested in angles of this plot, which in corners, which are here and here. So this will be proteins which are down-regulated and also statistically significant. These are proteins that are up-regulated and also statistically significant. And if we have more than one group, pair of groups to compare, we can also use heat maps where the x-axis will be comparison, for example, time one versus time zero, time two versus time zero, time three versus time zero, and the y-axis are the proteins, so blue means significantly down, red means significantly up, black means no change. So we can also look at proteins and how they evolve uh, in time. And the last step of statistical analysis would be, as I mentioned earlier, is the experimental design, where now we will see, given how much variability we have in the data, here the x-axis is the fold change, the smallest fold change we're interested in. The y-axis is the number of biological replicates. And based on the analysis of the data set, we will actually generate curves like that. So this would be the output of the um, of these tools. So now what I didn't tell you much about is this part, how we actually get from this normalized data to the list of p-values and the signif statistical significance. And that's what I would like to talk about next. Okay. Do you have any questions so far? Yes. Yes, and I hope we'll have time because I have a comment on that or an example. So, but you're absolutely right. Most experiments that we currently do in mass spectrometry and proteomics are dramatically underpowered and have dramatically like sm too small sample size that is needed. That is true. So let me then, I'd like to make sure I get to this point where I can show you the results of that. So let me just very kind of briefly, yes, please. Oh, yes. I, I'm really glad you asked. The question is, how can we develop quality control procedures that control for multiple proteins being quantified simultaneously? I'm really glad you asked, because we have a whole aspect of MS stats which does exactly that. I didn't put it in for time, but I most have to tell you what we do. We have, there's a lot of work that goes into that in terms of statistical methodology, how to detect <coughs> things which are so it's called system suitability and quality control and how to detect problems in various areas of um, mass spectrometry. And we have a whole module on MS that's dedicated to that, but it will have to be during the break. Okay. So, you know, there's really a lot that can, we can talk about uh, here, but clearly quality control is a very important part, especially because we ask for a large number of replicates. And if we want to have more replicates, we need to make sure that our instruments run as specified for a while. So this is a really important um, aspect of that. But let me maybe first illustrate something which we think is important, which also contributes to discrepancy in the ABRF study. Um, what happened in that study, among other things, is that people use different tools for identifying and quantifying peaks. And the different tools are developed for different purposes by different labs, and they make different assumptions, all for good reasons because they optimize for certain things. However, when you take a data set and you try to apply different tools to it and see what happens, the conclusions can vary substantially depending on whether assumptions of these tools you know, correspond to this data set or not. And what we're trying to do is to contribute to reproducibility of research in this area by trying to develop downstream statistical analysis steps which uh, try to read between the lines, essentially, and interpret the output of the tools not literally, but trying to understand the intention. And we hope that in that way we can improve the reproducibility and the accuracy of the results. 
Let me illustrate what I mean. So this is a data-dependent acquisition uh, experiment. It's another data set. It's from Jurgen Cox LFQ paper. It's also a controlled mixture. Um, doesn't really matter, so it has also some number of runs uh, and no changes in abundance. We analyzed this data set with three tools, Skyline, MaxQuant, and Progenesis. And here, the gray shape in the middle are the log intensities of everything that the tool reported, reported, the tools reported for this data set. So across all runs, all proteins, all peptides, all peaks, all ions, everything. So now, thi and this is another e example with data independent acquisition. So for this DDA data set, well, the first thing you see is that the gray areas here, these gray shapes, they're not identical. Remember, same data set, right? Just three different tools for data analysis. And so what you see already that this tool, for example, has values which are smaller. These values are in the middle, and these values are um, kind of also kind of in a similar range. Now here, this vertical bar is the number of values which are either exactly zero or very close to zero is reported to the tool. We see that MaxQuant clearly has some kind of truncation cutoff. It doesn't report any zeros. These two tools report some substantial number of small values. So uh, Skyline reports 203,000 peaks. MaxQuant reports 224,000 peaks. Progenesis reports 56,000 peaks. So MaxQuant has no zeros. Skyline has 1,000 zeros. Um, Progenesis has 600 zeros. But then in terms of missing values, MaxQuant has 38,000 missing values. So clearly, the patterns of data are very different. And the same thing here for data independent acquisition. So how can we work with this very diverse type of input, which comes from, or the output that comes from these tools? So what we do here is um, trying to read between the lines and say, OK, essentially, when the peak intensities are large, it's fine. Even if they're not the same, values, it's understandable because some tools will integrate the peak entirely, others will truncate the tails, others will maybe quantify peak at the height of the, the, the intensity at the height. So the numeric values of intensities will be different. If we can compare them between the conditions, that's all we need. However, when the values are small, this is where trouble really is, because zeros and missing values and small values, that's what really interferes with our conclusions. And what we decided to do is to say, well, Let's come up with this cutoff, which we defined empirically, and which is data set specific. And we will say that for everything below this cutoff, call it 0, an A, small value, anything else, we don't trust the data. And we can develop a statistical procedure which will say we have these missing values, but they're informatively missing, because in statistical language is called censored. So it means that they're missing, but we know something about them. We know that they come from low intensity values. And we can incorporate this into the statistical analysis. And so what we will do, we will look at this type of data structure for one protein. So here we have multiple runs. They are grouped by the fact that they come from the same condition. And these are other runs which come from other condition. We have multiple biological replicates, potentially technical replicates. Now the rows are the features in the mass spectrometry. These are technical uh, features of the data acquisition. And these missing values, we will interpret them as missing informatively. And so these missing values are the ones. Now, everything which is below this vertical cutoff is interpreted as an informative missing value. And we will do things which I don't have time about th to talk about now, but we will do things which accounts for this informative missing and accounts for outliers to do a summarization which is more um, meaningful. And so this is just one example. This is this protein from the ABRF study that I mentioned in the beginning. We had four conditions. And this was one of the spiked proteins. So in this particular case, the gray lines are all these peptide ions which were detected for this protein. This was a fairly abundant uh, protein. And you see there are many things around zero, many outliers. This horizontal line is the line below which we don't trust the values. So the green line here, this is the summary that very often is done, where we take the sum of the intensities of all the analytes and then take the log. You see that this line is really affected by various outliers in high-intensity peptides and low-intensity peptides. So if we compare condition 1 to condition 2, the true fold change is 7.5. Taking the sum and then the log gives us a fold change of 
So clearly this is not a good way to summarize this data. And then there are different approaches. Linear models essentially like an average. You see that the average gave us 29-fold change because it was affected by outliers. So uh, the robust summarization will be doing the most appropriate thing, and this is the right line here. And it gets as close to the true value as possible. But the reason why I'm thinking that this is a really useful way to think about these problems is the reproducibility. Remember, again, in the beginning, I said that different tools ended up with different conclusions. So now, if we compare taking, for example, the sum of the intensity and then the log in this IPRG study, in the uh, study that I just mentioned, and if we look at how many true spiked proteins were detected by either Skyline or Max Quant or Progenesis, by taking the sum and then the log and then some simple statistical analysis, we have only 11 changes which were in common bef between these three analyses. If we do this kind of in a more advanced way, we see that we improve the reproducibility between the results. And this is the other control mixture. This is one more control mixture that we have. And across the board, if we interpret the data in a more meaningful way, we improve the reproducibility of our conclusions. So we improve, we minimize the dependence of our conclusions on the specific choices of the tools that we made. So this is really important. And the same thing for DIA. So we made these comparisons a, a lot. And across the board, if we interpret the data in a more meaningful way and read between the lines, we improve the agreement and the accuracy of conclusions uh, across the tools. So that's really um, an important point here. So now, since you asked about the sample size, let me use the last five minutes, or maybe just before, let me just make sure I mentioned, so MS stats is a free and open source. We have its own website. You can find a lot of documentation and code and so on from that. So now, if since you asked about replicates, let me skip something up here, and let me talk about the importance of experimental design and the importance of replicates. So um, everything we discussed here, we do it for a purpose, right? Because we want to study the living organisms, for example, understanding which proteins are affected by the disease, or even in clinical case, in case of discovery of biomarkers, we want to know which proteins can be indicative or a signature or predictive of the status of the disease. And this is a very common application of mass spectrometry, although by no means the only one. And we were interested in exactly that question. So do we have enough replicates currently in our experiments to even get <coughs> accurate prediction of the disease, to get accurate biomarker discovery? And how the need for replicates is affected by the scope of proteome coverage. Because a lot of effort in technology development now is in terms of identifying and quantifying more and more proteins, longer and longer lists of proteins. And our question was, what, is the, what are the implications in terms of experimental design and in terms of sample size if our experiments increase the coverage of the proteome? And that was really the question. So uh, just to kind of uh, set the stage here. This was one data set that we used as a motivating example. It was a targeted SRM experiment where we quantified 70 proteins among 200 subjects. And the goal was to compare colorectal cancer uh, versus healthy and also versus benign tumor. So this is a pretty large case study, large scale study, and we use this as a motivation. Moreover, not only we quantified 200 subjects here, we had a separate validation set of 269 subjects, which we used to essentially evaluate the performance of the signatures which we identified here. So this is to find the signatures, and this is to evaluate, evaluate their performance. We can use this to see what is the reasonable range of the sample size. And the methods we use are the classification methods. Now, it's different from what I talked about before, because now the goal is to find to, to predict the disease status for each person separately. So the method will work like this. If we have two proteins here, for example, the blue dot is a healthy person, the red dot is the diseased person, this particular decision rule will ignore protein 1 and say high values of protein 2 means healthy, low values of protein 2 means disease. Now here's a more complicated rule which uses both proteins and classifies red and blue better. 
This is probably a too complicated rule, which will not be reproducible in the next studies. So we're looking for some kind of decision rules like that. So in this particular study, and this is what MSTAT is currently doing as well, we decided to use one particular rule like that, which is developed by a method called random forest. It's just a very easy method to implement, doesn't really matter. So what we decided to do is this. If we have stable biomarkers, and if the prediction is robust and accurate, then if we have a few more subjects or a few fewer subjects, it shouldn't really matter for our prediction rule, right? Because the detailed inclusion of the subject should not be very important. So what we can do is to take our data set here in the training set, and let's take a random subset of the subjects. Find the signatures, see how well we do in terms of predictive accuracy, but also see how often we select the same proteins <laughs> okay. <laughs> not sure what happened. I'm not touching anything. So um, okay, so we take a subset of subjects, try to find a signature, see how accurate it is, and see which proteins were predictive. Let's do it again. Take some other subsets of individuals from the sample. Find the signature, see how accurate it is, and which proteins were predictive. And do it over and over 100 times. And so the idea would be that if our procedure is robust, we will have the same proteins predictive, and the accuracy will be high. Right? And so what we will do here is, this is 100 times we repeat the process. This is for each protein, how often it was selected as predictive. So now let's take a look at the results. <coughs> so let's say we take only 10 subjects in the study. So this would be quite typical in many mass spectrometry experiments. And let's say we target only 20 most abundant proteins. This is like the low, kind of the easiest case. So now the predictive accuracy will be 0.4 and each protein will be selected roughly half of the time as predictive. Which is already not great, right? We are 50% of the times right, and each pr protein is only selected half of the times as predictive, depending on which subjects we include in the study. Now, if we have more proteins, okay, predictive accuracy improved a little bit because now we have more proteins to choose from, right, as being predictive. But we see now that the number of times each protein is selected as predictive went down to 25%. If we include more proteins in the study, the predictive accuracy dropped, and each protein is only selected 25% of times. So let me repeat that, right? So if we only have 10 subjects, if we increase our protein coverage, on one hand, we lose predictive accuracy. And on the other hand, it's only a quarter of time each protein is selected consistently as predictive. So we have different proteins coming and going depending on which subject we select in the study. So these are not robust predictions and not robust signatures. Now, we can repeat this by increasing the number of replicates. And across the board, we see that, that as the number of proteins increase, the predictive accuracy first goes up and then drops down. Here, the predictive accuracy goes up and drops down, and so on. So the only principled way to improve the accuracy and improve the stability of our inclusions is to have a much larger number of replicates than what is currently done. And this is only with 70 proteins. So essentially, the price for large proteome coverage for this type of problems is extremely high. And I think people do not quite appreciate this currently. And MSTAT does this type of examples for any particular data set that you have. We also can simulate data. When we have a very small data set, we can pretend that we have larger number of replicates by simulating them. And this is what it would look like. So here we can take a data set, um, project a future study with that many proteins, project a future study with that many subjects. And here, for each combination we report, the proportion of times when truly predictive proteins that we simulate actually detected by the algorithm as truly predictive. 
And so you see that again, the true, the only principled way to have some robust conclusions <laughs> is increase sample size and reduce the number of proteins. And depending on which data set we use for simulation, you know, the numbers vary, uh, but the qualitative conclusion is always the same. Okay, so this is, um, you know, I will probably stop here. So let me just um, make two final points. So one is that I hope I conveyed the message that there's a lot that goes into the data analysis, experimental design and data analysis. And things are quite complex. And they have to be because we have a complex process that we have to work with, right? And if we want to have results that are reproducible, we actually have very high standards to meet in terms of what it means to do reproducible research, right? So on one hand, we have repeatable data analysis where we can repeat exactly the same process with the same data and get the same numbers back. And I can tell you, even that is very challenging. Reproducible data analysis means that our results don't depend on the tool. If we analyze the same data set with different tools, we will not have identical numbers, but we should have the same qualitative conclusions. <coughs> now, at the same time, what we want is to repeat the same experiment with the same biological material and get the same qualitative conclusions. And the gold standard is have new biological samples, maybe new patients in the study or new you know, animals, and have the same qualitative conclusions. And a lot will have to go into that if we really want to have reproducible quantitative results. And so statistical mindset contributes to this part in terms of automated workflows, which are fully transparent, documentable, and open. Here, in terms of data analysis, which understands how to appropriately model the data and handle the variation. And there's a lot of uh, additional things that need to be done in terms of assay characterization, system suitability, and QC. And this part is more about experimental design. How do we select the right number of replicates? How can we predict that our experiment will be meaningful for what we try to accomplish? OK, if all of this sounds overwhelming, and it probably is <coughs> in, in many ways, there is hope. So remember I said that we think that training is very important. I think this program like here is a really important thing for that. And we also have a training effort which is quite complementary to the program here in that it is more in-depth and specifically dedicated to statistics and computation. So it's called May Institute on Computation and Statistics for Mass Spectrometry and Proteomics. Um, this was from last year. We have the dates already. It's the first two weeks in May 2019. And we have, it runs for two weeks, and we have two parallel classrooms. So we have seven different programs which cover R for beginners, statistics for beginners, data visualization, statistical analysis uh, for mass spectrometry. And we also have introduction to tools such as Skyline and OpenMS. And we also have uh, case studies in data independent acquisition. We have fantastic instructors um, for all these tools. We have Brendan, who is a developer of Skyline, Oliver, who is a developer of uh, OpenMS, uh, Lauren Gatto, who is a leader in bioconductor and um, R based effort for mass spectrometry, and uh, Kylie, who is an expert in more kind of advanced uh, things in R, and Rudy and Mike McCoss. They give lectures on, you know, kind of broader perspective lecture. But these are so each of them is a two and a half day program which dives quite deeply, hands on, in various aspects of things that I talked about here. So um, this is the website. It will be first two weeks in May 2019. We will probably make the website live early September. If you would, and we have most importantly we have tuition waivers and travel fellowships for students and postdocs. So. Uh, hopefully this will be helpful. Okay, last thing, I really need to help many people who help me get to the point where I start understanding the problems in, <laughs> in mass spectrometry and how we can contribute. MS Stats was developed by many students in my lab in particular, uh, Mina Choi. Uh, AB the ABRF community was really useful in terms of understanding the needs for quantification. Uh, a lot of work is in collaboration with the MacOS lab and with the Abrasol lab and Arab did a lot of work on system suitability, which maybe I'll have a chance to talk about offline. OK, that's it. Uh, questions? <laughs>
just to follow up on the original question, um, <clears throat> would it be better to uh, perform, I mean, there's a power issue with these things, but would it be better to perform replicate analysis um, across populations, or is it better to do a larger sample size? You're, you say you're limited, you can't do the perfect sample size. Well, uh, not sure I understand. Uh, so usually what, uh, what you do is to say, okay, this is what I can afford essentially, right? Either because these are the samples that I can access, or this is the limit of the instrument time, or and so on, right? And then what you need to do is to, on one hand, say, okay, these are the samples that I have. What can they reasonably represent? For example, uh, if you only have uh, samples from older patients, right? You probably don't want to make conclusions about young people, right? Or if you have only samples from females, you probably don't want to make conclusions about males. So this is one thing, right? But another thing is that if you have limited resources, this type of calculation is extremely important in terms of, okay, these are the smallest fall changes I'm interested in, right? Or this is the predictive ability I'm interested in. What can my you know, number of runs, what can I reasonably expect from that? And if you have limited resources, you can still do the experiment, right? Because you can still use this to generate hypotheses, right, for a follow-up. But what is really important for, like, from this type of calculations is to manage your expectations, essentially, right? So to say, okay, if I do this, how likely it is that my results will be reproducible? How likely the results will be meaningful? And in terms of hypothesis generation, you can still have small-scale studies you know, on some subset of samples. It's okay. But just understand the limitations of that, right? Yeah, okay. We can talk about this offline. <laughs> Thank you for the next talk. Um, can you comment on data imputation for missing values? Uh, I know in metabolomics people do it. When I talk with my students, they said, oh, this is like making up data. Can you comment on that? How do you impute? And what's, uh, what's the best way of doing it? Well, we advocate not to impute the data. So, so the problem with imputation is that um, yeah, you make a new data point, right? And then your method thinks that you have more data than you really have. So we would rather do what I just described, where we say these are essentially all now being treated as missing and missing informatively, so missing because they're low abundance. So instead of imputing, you can actually, there are statistical techniques which can handle sensor data directly. So when you try to understand, for example, what is the uh, summary in a run, you say, okay, this is a missing, but it's missing at low value. So you adapt your summary based on censoring. So essentially, there are statistical techniques which can handle that without imputing. And uh, it does it can, it's, it's a more appropriate way of doing this. Maybe I can also tell you more uh, offline. Take one more question we have right over here. Hi, I'm wondering if you can comment on, these were looking at clinical samples, if you've done this with something like a cell line or a mouse model that might be a little more yeah. um, okay. easier Actually, to have a things. smaller statistical you value. Know, there's, there's so much to talk about. <laughs> um, so the problem with, not the problem, the fact with this type of analysis is that it aims for prediction, meaning that you want to predict the status of whatever disease or treatment and so on for individual patient. Typically, this is not a question with cell lines, right? With cell lines, you want to know, on average, over my cell line grows, what's regulated? So you would do a different type of analysis. And this type of analysis is this power curve calculations that I mentioned here. So my example with previously was with prediction. This is the example with testing. So there are different statistical <laughs> procedures. They require different approach, different modeling, a different approach for sample size calculation. But the conclusion is the same, that you would need to make sure that you understand how much variability you have in your either biological or measurement system to overcome this variation by the sample size. So even if you have cell lines, let's say you have some really complicated enrichment procedure right, or, or sample prep procedure which introduces variability somehow, it means that you would need to have more replicates to overcome this variability. So it's not just the, the cell lines. And here's another thing, proteome coverage, um, 
also has implications for the sample size, even if you work with cell lines. And what I didn't mention here is this. So this line is what happens if you only had one protein in your study. This line is the sample size needed if half of your proteins are expected to change between conditions. But this is the line that would be expected if only 1% of your proteins changes between conditions. So think DIA, right? For example, when you have many proteins, very few changes. And the reason why protein coverage will imply different sample size is because a lot of work here goes to protect ourselves against false positives. So if everything is a true change, there is no false positives, right? But if you expect that only 1% of proteins are truly changing, you have a lot of opportunity for false positives, and you need to work harder to protect yourself against false positives, and work harder means more replicates. So essentially, there are really different aspects of statistics that go into these different problems uh, which need to be considered. And I don't think that in one hour we can really describe this much. So I really invite you to participate in our May program next year where we spend a lot of time and in great details talking about these issues. Thank you. <laughs>